eighth grade, so we're continuing to read I Am Malala. Um, we are reading parts three and four this week. Um, so I'm going to start with chapter 15 piece. One morning in February, we awoke to gunfire. It wasn't unusual for us to be awakened several times each night by the sounds of gunfire, but this was different. The people from Mingora were firing guns into the air to celebrate a peace treaty. The government had agreed to impose Sharia if the Taliban would stop fighting. Sharia meant that all aspects of life from property disputes to personal hygiene would be dictated by religious judges. Even though people criticized the peace deal, I was happy because it meant I could go back to school. Since 2007, more than a thousand people had been killed. Women had been kept in Purda, schools and bridges had been blown up, businesses had closed, and the people of Swat had lived with constant fear. But now it was all to stop. Perhaps the Taliban would settle down, go back to their homes, and let us live as peaceful citizens. Best of all, the Taliban had relented on the questions of girls' schools. Even older girls could return to school. We would pay a small price, though. We could go to school as long as we kept ourselves covered in public. Fine, I thought, if that's what it takes. While school was closed, I had continued doing interviews about girls' right to education, and my father and I attended rallies and even and events to spread our message as far and wide as we could. But now, GOTV, the biggest channel in our country, wanted to interview a girl about the peace treaty. We were being interviewed on the rooftop of a hotel at night. They wired me with a microphone and counted down five, four, three, two, one. The interviewer asked me how the peace deal would affect girls and whether I thought it should happen. The peace treaty had only just been announced and already someone had violated it. A journalist who had recently interviewed my father had been killed. I was disappointed in the treaty already and I said so. We are really sad that the situation is getting worse. We were expecting peace and to go back to school. The future of our country can never be bright if we don't educate the young generation. The government should take action and help us. But I wasn't done, I added. I am not afraid of anyone. I will get my education, even if I have to sit on the floor to continue it. I have to continue my education and I will do it. How and how had I become so bold, I wondered. Well, Malala, I told myself, you're not doing anything wrong. You are speaking for peace for your rights, for the rights of girls. That's not wrong, that's your duty. After the interview, a friend of my father's asked him, how old is Malala? When my father told him I was 11, he was shocked. She is Paka Jenny, Janai, he said, wise beyond her years. Then he asked, how did she get that way? My father said, circumstances have made her so. But we were badly deceived after the imposition of Sharia, the Taliban became even bolder. Now they openly patrolled the streets of Mingora with guns and sticks as if they were the army. They killed policemen and dumped their bodies by the side of the road. They beat a shopkeeper because he allowed women to shop for lipstick unaccompanied. And they threatened the women at the bazaar, including my mother. One day when my mother went to the market to buy a gift for my cousin's wedding, a big burly Talib accosted her and blocked her way. I could beat you, you know, for leaving your home without proper burqa, he said. Do you understand? My mother was angry and frightened. He meant a shuck shuckle cock burqa, which covers the whole face, with only a mesh grill to see through. She was wearing a fashion burqa and didn't even own the other kind. Yes, okay, she said. I will wear this in the future. She had never told a lie before, but then again, she had never been confronted at the market by a man with a machine gun before. Good, said the man. Next time, I will not be so nice to you. Soon we were to learn that even burqa was no protection against the whims of the Taliban. One day I came home to find my father and his friends watching a video on his phone. I leaned in to see what the fuss was about. In the video, a teenage girl wearing a black burqa and red trousers was lying face down on the ground being flogged in broad daylight by a bearded man in a black turban. Please stop it, she begged in between screams and whimpers as each blow was delivered. In the name of Allah, I am dying. You could hear the Talib shouting, hold her down, hold her hands down. At one point during the flogging, her burqa slipped up to reveal her trousers. The beating stopped for a moment so the men could cover her up again. Then they went back to beating her. A crowd had gathered but did nothing. 
One of the girl's relatives even volunteered to help hold her down. By the time it was over, she had been struck 34 times. A few days later, the video was everywhere, even on TV, and the Taliban took credit. This woman came out of her house with a man who was not her husband, so we had to punish her, a spokesman said. Some boundaries cannot be crossed. Woman, she was a teenager, maybe six years older than me. Yes, a boundary had been crossed. Grown men had taken to beating teenagers. Soon, soon the shelling began again. As we all huddled together in the dining room, one question was on our minds. What kind of peace was this? The New York Times documentary had aired and brought even more attention to the plight of girls in SWAT, and we started receiving messages of support from people all over the world. I saw then how powerful the media can be. We even heard from a, from a 19 year old Pakistani girl in the United States, a student at Stan Stanford, she's a Shahid. She would eventually play a big part in our campaign for education. For the first time, we knew our story was being heard beyond the borders of Pakistan. On April 20, on 20 April, Shufi Mahadid, Mohammed, the TS, the TNSM leader who had helped facilitate the peace deal between the government and the Taliban, Taliban and the Fasula's father-in-law came to Menorah to make a speech. That morning, my brothers and I peered out the gate as hundreds of people filed past our house on their way to the rally. Some teenage Taliban fighters went past playing victory songs on their mobile phones and singing along in loud, excited voices. Quickly, we closed the gate so they couldn't see us. Eventually, a huge crowd, nearly 40,000 people gathered. And even though the field was quite away from, away from our house, we could hear the hum of thousands of voices chanting Taliban songs. It was a chilling sound. Our father had left the house that morning to watch the rally from the rooftop of a nearby building. When he came home that evening, he looked as if he had aged 100 years. The speech was a disappointment. We had thought Sufi Muhammad would tell his followers followers to put down their weapons, but instead he called democracy and un Islamic and and democracy un Islamic and encouraged them to keep fighting. It's not enough that they've had their way in SWAT, my father said. The Taliban are marching on Islamabad. Even some of Sufi Muhammad's own followers were unhappy with this turn of events. Within days the Taliban streamed into the city of Bunner, a town just south of SWAT, only sixty miles from the capital. Now that the capital was at risk, the army planned a counterattack once again. Menor was squarely in the middle. This time, my mother said we should leave and take shelter in Shangla. So now we are um, once again into part three here. Thirteen. I'm sorry, part three. Um, so make sure we are making connections. We're looking at pages 20 and 21 during part three. Um, Think about obviously how painful this must be for the people in this area, um, what they're going through as far as um, the fighting, the beatings, the violence. Try to make connections with um, Malala and the other people there. Um, then go into part four, and as you're doing part four, you can work on page 23. I hope you have a great week. Take care.